Hello, mortals. I am the booktube goddess, the number one drag queen booktuber on YouTube. Let the games begin! When I joined Gavin Hetherington's Believe-a-thon, Read-a-thon, I needed a book recommendation for one of the prompts, and Gavin had suggested the middle grade book, The House with a Clock in Its Walls by John Belairs. This was the first book in a long series of middle grade horror mystery books about a young boy named Louis Barnavolt. So, while I was researching this author, John Belairs, something popped out at me. Belairs only wrote one adult fantasy book, and it was the inspiration for the magic system, or one of the inspirations, for the magic system of Dungeons and Dragons. And I went, whoop, whoop. <laughs> now, I knew that Jack Vance's Dying Earth inspired Gary Gygax, who created Dungeons and Dragons D&D. But I don't remember hearing about Belair's, so I was very curious. So, of course, I had to dig up an old Dungeon Master's manual and look up where Belair's book was referenced. The book is called The Face in the Frost, and it was listed as inspiration for Dungeons and Dragons, and specifically in reference to the spell system. What the heck was this book, and why hadn't I heard of it? Well, again, it was Belair's only adult novel, and he pretty much devoted his writing to the middle grade Lewis Barnavolt books. And on further research, Belair's book, The Face in the Wall, when it was published in 1969, it got some really rave reviews. Lynn Carter praised it as one of only three of the best fantasy novels to be published since Lord of the Rings. And Ursula K. Le Guin, who you know I love, she described it as an authentic fantasy by a writer who knows what wizardry is all about. She also praised the skill in which Belair's navigated between humor and darker elements. Now, Belair's wrote in correspondence that The Face in the Frost was an attempt to write in the Tolkien manner. I was much taken by the Lord of the Rings and wanted to do a modest work on those lines. In reading the latter book, I was struck by the fact that Gandalf was not much of a person, just a good guy. So I gave Prospero, my wizard, most of my phobias and crushes. It was simply meant as entertainment and any profundity will have to be read in. Prospero is the main character of the novel, and he's a crotchety old wizard. There is no young hero or heroine, no romantic subplots, just Prospero, an old man with insecurities and fears, and his friend Roger Bacon, a fellow wizard. The closest character I can think of who comes in the vicinity of Prospero is probably Rincewind in the Discworld novels. Except Prospero, unlike Rincewind, is actually a powerful wizard. Now, reading the book, I can understand why he wrote children's books because the voice of his writing, his storytelling, is one of the strongest I've ever read in an adult book. Now, voice is the personality of the writing. Usually, at least in modern books these days, authors try to have invisible voices, let the story speak for itself. Normally, strong third-person voices are seen only in middle grade books, but it's always a delight, to me anyway, when it's in an adult book. Now, here is the first paragraph of chapter one, so you can see what I'm talking about. Chapter 1 Several centuries, or so, ago, in a country whose name doesn't matter, there was a tall, skinny, straggly-bearded old wizard named Prospero, 
and not the one you are thinking of, either. He lived in a huge, ridiculous, doodad-covered, trash-filled, two-story horror of a house that stumbled, staggered, and dribbled right up to the edge of a great shadowy forest of elms and oaks and maples. It was a house whose gutter spouts were worked into the shape of whistling sphinxes and screaming bearded faces, a house whose white wooden porch was decorated with carved bears, monkeys, toads, and fat women in togas holding sheaves of grain, a house whose steep gray slate roof was capped with a glass-enclosed, twisty copper-columned observatory. On the artichoke dome of the observatory was a weather vane shaped like a dancing hippopotamus. As the wind changed, it blew through the nostrils of the hippo's hollow head, making a whiny, snarfling sound that fortunately could not be heard unless you were up on the roof fixing slates. Now, the plot is relatively simple. Something dark and mysterious is loose in the land, and Prospero and Roger decide they must figure out what the mystery is and go off on a quest of discovery. Now, there is a lot of humor, especially in the dialogue between Prospero and Roger, but there's also scenes that rapidly escalate to very serious and dark and somber. So, like Ursula K. Le Guin said, Belair's had a skill of navigating between humor and dark elements. Now, this is a very short book. It's a very quick read. I think the title sucks. I wonder if it had a better title, if it may have been more well-known as a fantasy book. I don't know. Now, another critique, I would have liked the villain to have been developed a little better, all things considered, but I have to say I really enjoyed this book. And I can totally see why Gygax was inspired by it when he created Dungeons and Dragons. Now, The Face in the Frost definitely gets my blessing. And if you are a Dungeons and Dragons fan and want to read one of the novels that inspired Gary Gygax, this is a really fun one to start with. Now please like this video and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. It would mean so much to me and really helps me out. Until we meet again, may all the books you read be blessed. Thank <laughs> you.